This is Rick Malone for the San Francisco Symphony. In 1942, the world was at war. Two years earlier, Hitler and Stalin had signed a non-aggression pact between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, but it lasted less than a year. Germany attacked the USSR, and American citizens suddenly had to get used to the idea that, after a quarter century of mistrust, the Russians were now our allies. Music played a big part in this relationship, specifically the music of Dmitry Shostakovich. He even made the cover of Time magazine in 1942, just a couple of months after the premiere of his seventh symphony, the Leningrad. His fifth symphony was already popular in this country, and as soon as the seventh had its Soviet premiere, there was a mad scramble to get it performed here. After several years out of official favor, Shostakovich was once again a hero of the Soviet Union, and this work seemed to cement his reputation, at least for a little while. Leningrad was Shostakovich's hometown, although when he was born it was still known as St. Petersburg. The Nazis were already advancing on the city when he started working on his symphony in July 1941, and he begged the government to let him stay and finish it. But he and his family were moved for their safety to an artist's colony in the town of Kuybyshev in the south of Russia, and the move probably saved their lives. The siege of Leningrad was one of the deadliest in history. It lasted 900 days, and almost a million people died in the bombings, shellings, and fires, or of cold, starvation, or disease. In 1979, a Russian musicologist named Solomon Volkov published a book called Testimony, which was supposedly Shostakovich's memoirs, as told to Volkov. It caused a huge amount of controversy, and still does, because it contradicted much of what Shostakovich had said about his music during his lifetime, and recast him as a secret subversive, writing coded protests about Stalin and his regime into his works. The Seventh Symphony had been described at its premiere as portraying the heroism of the Soviet people in their struggle against the Nazis. But in testimony, Shostakovich, or Volkov, says that it was planned before the war and therefore, quote, simply cannot be seen as a reaction to Hitler's attack. I was thinking, he writes, of other enemies of humanity. I feel eternal pain for those who were killed by Hitler, but I feel no less pain for those killed on Stalin's orders. I have nothing against calling the seventh the Leningrad Symphony, but it's not about Leningrad under siege. It's about the Leningrad that Stalin destroyed and the Hitler merely finished off." End quote. Now, Shostakovich's son, Maxim, vehemently disputed this claim, along with a good deal of the rest of the book. He wrote that since every movement is dated specifically, there can be no question that the symphony was not pre-planned, but was written in direct reaction to the horrors of the siege. Regardless of its inspiration, it is a harrowing portrait of survival in the face of unimaginable horrors and of the sometimes grim slog toward triumph. Shostakovich had originally given each movement a subtitle, and the first movement was to be called War. He marked the tempo Allegretto, which generally refers not only to a relatively quick pace, but a light-hearted mood. Shostakovich's Allegrettos, though, are almost always grim, or at least grimly humorous, as if he was highlighting the irony. Certainly the mood here is intense and relentlessly serious.
So many of Shostakovich's works begin with a stark, unharmonized melody. This time, it's punctuated by the basses, trumpets, and drums. It is a dark march, but it soon gives way to a softly lyrical violin melody. The movement proceeds like a typical symphonic exposition, but then Shostakovich turns the melody and the structure of the movement on its head. As the piccolo and violin finish their duet, a snare drum begins to play a new march rhythm, quietly, as though from a distance. The violins and then the violas set the tune. In another context, it could be called jaunty, but in this setting and this orchestration, the menace is unmistakable. The winds, the brass, and eventually all the instruments join in. It's the greatest repetitive crescendo since Ravel's Bolero. Shostakovich never denied that connection, but he also acknowledged the similar pattern of repetition that drives the finale of Sibelius's Symphony No. 2. In an article called On True and So-Called Program Music, written in 1951, Shostakovich refers to these pages as the invasion, and he had also written that this passage represented the sudden eruption of war into our peaceful lives. Unfortunately, this later got him in trouble. Government critics complained that he had done a better job portraying the enemy than the heroism of the Soviet people. The key changes and leads to a crushing climax. The lyrical music returns. but the sounds that dominate the closing moments are the soft but relentless snare drum and fragments of the invasion march. After the enormity of the first movement, the mood has to lighten, and it does, in a short scherzo that Shostakovich originally called Memories. The lyrical music returns. But then the music speeds up to an almost frantic pace. And the winds bring in the first moments of humor in the work. No matter what the situation, said Shostakovich, he could not do without humor. The movement ends quietly with just a few dancing shadows of the initial theme.
The original title for the adagio was Our Country's Wide Spaces. Shostakovich wrote that he hoped to portray his beloved Leningrad by twilight, with its streets and the banks of the River Neva suspended in stillness. The big chords and unison melodies are not that different from how Aaron Copland was portraying the open spaces of America at about the same time. A haunting flute solo introduces a faster and fiercer episode. And the climax brings back the opening chords combining the two themes. The snare drum returns, but peters out as the movement comes to a quiet close. A series of drum beats moves the work into its victory finale, but the march to victory begins once again in the dark. the tempo begins to build. To climax in a march combined with what seems like a hymn. At this point, Shostakovich pulls back to reflect on those who have lost their lives. And it is the dark and beautiful sound of the violas that begins the slow crawl toward triumph. The path is not direct, though. Shostakovich takes the music through many twists, turns, and key changes. It is victory, unmistakably, but it is not an easy victory. The road to the Leningrad Symphony's American premiere was almost as difficult, and it ended up in a nasty dispute between two of the world's most famous conductors, Leopold Stokowski and Arturo Toscanini. Toscanini won out, and the work actually received 62 performances in its first year. It had been four decades since a new musical composition had attracted so much attention in America or been so eagerly awaited, and certainly there's been nothing like it since. But even while the war continued and Americans were still sympathetic to the Soviet Union, the Leningrad Symphony suddenly disappeared perhaps swallowed up in its own ideology. But its drama bears eloquent witness to the time it was written, a valuable testament from a composer that we've come to recognize as an essential reporter on the human condition in the middle of the 20th century.
This is Rick Malone for the San Francisco Symphony.